Howdy everyone, my name is Griffin Furlong. I am a professional civil engineer. And in today's video, I wanna do a very basic lesson on stormwater management. We will be looking at a larger residential site and we'll sift through some of the geotech reports, the survey, and start understanding how we can set the control water levels of the ponds and how we even start thinking about the drainage design. But I'm ready to dive into it, so let's get to it. All right, here we have our residential site. We are looking at all of the different geotech bores. So in this case, we have a whole bunch of different bore locations and different bore types. I'm very interested in all of the pond borings. The pond borings are the PB1s. Now, the typical process is you work through a concept plan or a site plan, then you give it to the geotechnical engineer so they can go out and understand all the soils in the areas that we need. So in this case, we've developed our site plan and we have our proposed pond locations. Now, if you want a little knowledge about why we've picked some of these different pond locations, let me kind of dive into that just a little bit. So if we go to this drainage plan, we can look at all of the existing topography. I'm gonna zoom in here. Let's start with why we would even put a pond right there and why we would put a pond right here. Notice how there's a ridge right here. I'm seeing contours of 52, 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46, 45. It just drops down, right? If I were to draw an arrow of the way water flows, water is flowing all the way towards this big center wetland right here. And same if we go to this side. I'm seeing contour of 52, 51, 50, yada, yada, yada. So all this water is flowing this way. Now, typically ponds are placed usually on the lower points of the site. And since we have two large wetlands, one right here and one to the east of our site, these would be very good locations to place our ponds because they were in the lower portions of the site. Now you're probably asking, well, why do they have to be on the lower portion? Well, think about how water flows. Water flows from the very highest point to the lowest point. So in this case, we're not changing any of the existing water patterns. If a water droplet decided to drop on our proposed site, we are going to collect it in our system and it's going to go away like it used to, all the way down to this point. Also, a lot of times in Florida or the Southeast region, we have relatively flat areas. And a lot of the times municipalities will require you to set all of your road low points and lot grades based off your design high water levels of your proposed ponds. So if you think about it, the lower that you can make these design high waters, the lower your site because the goal is to try to keep your site as close to existing as possible or else you're bringing in a lot of fill to your site and this ends up becoming very, very expensive. So that's the basis of why we've set ponds right here. I can make a whole nother video diving into how we could site plan these out, but today is all about how we're going to start thinking about stormwater management, how we start setting these pond control waters and what we need to be thinking about. So now we're back to the geotech report. And what I will say is the most important things when it comes to designing this site is number one, you have to know the pre-development discharge rate. This site right here develops a certain amount of discharge. Discharge is a rate of flow. There's some sort of CFS, Q, whatever your units are. So remember how I was talking about that ridge, right? There's some sort of ridge right here and it's developing a certain amount of discharge in its precondition. And all of this water sheet flows right into this wetland right here, and all of this stormwater flows right into this wetland right there. Now I have a few videos about this already. I would highly recommend you check those out, but that's the whole premise of doing a drainage design. You're trying not to interfere with the existing patterns of your site. So if I had a certain amount of stormwater going to this wetland, and a certain amount of stormwater going to this wetland, I don't wanna interfere with that flow nor cause any rise in stage in these wetlands or into offsite properties. Because at the end of the day, we are going to be discharging to bodies of water, ditches, channels, and we can't cause a rise in those stages and offsite properties. Imagine if you're a homeowner down here and all of a sudden you start seeing a whole bunch of flooding in your area, you're gonna get a call and you might end up getting sued. And that's the liability that stormwater designers hold. So now that we understand the why of, of what we're doing, we're trying to meet a pre-development versus post-development discharge and staging. 
let's start understanding how we can start thinking about some of these pond control waters. So I'm just gonna walk through one example here. Let's go to this pond right here. It's the northeast corner. We have a couple of PBs, which is pond borings. And then we have a couple of hand augers here, but I'm really interested in the seasonal high water of these PB ones and twos. The reason why seasonal high water is important is because it is the rainy season water level. You're gonna have a fluctuation with your groundwater and your seasonal high. But since you wanna be conservative and not have a whole bunch of liability on your hands, it's best that you design per the seasonal high water, which will be higher than your groundwater table. And notice how if I go over here, we have a wetland that we are going to tie into. I wanna tie into this wetland because again, in the pre-development, all of this discharge goes to this wetland. Again, I don't wanna interfere with the discharge. So if I'm going to be placing a whole bunch of impervious pavement that has a whole bunch of oils and greases from cars, I need to be able to treat that into this system and then discharge it into the environment. So that's one thing that I actually forgot to mention is there's two purposes of these ponds. There's number one, you need to treat any sort of pollutants that come from your fertilizers, from your impervious area, your greases, oils, all that stuff. And then number two, I need to hold a certain amount of stormwater in my pond so I'm not flooding offsite properties. So that's the main point of a stormwater management system. But where I was headed with this is I notice a wetland here that has a seasonal high water of 43. So when I'm looking at this pond, I wanna see what the seasonal high waters at the geotech reported. So I'm gonna to go to PB1 and PB2. Now I really love Bluebeam. You can do this view here and do split vertical. And then I'm gonna to go to my thumbnails here. Let's find PB1 and PB2. So here are the bores. Notice how it gives elevation in feet, NAVD 88. And it looks like we got some water levels here, but I always suggest that you understand the, the legend. So this is depth groundwater encountered in date measured. So this is groundwater. This isn't the seasonal high water that we need, but it can still serve as good information. So it looks like this groundwater is somewhere between 40 to 45 now. I don't love this because it's not telling me a whole bunch of information. I really need the seasonal high water. Maybe there's a table. So here's a table here. This is the estimated normal seasonal high groundwater table. So we have the boring location PB1, estimated seasonal high groundwater table per NAVD 88. And it looks like it's 42.4 for that PB1 right there. Now we need to know PB2. Let's go to the next page, 42.9. Okay, I'm gonna go mark this guy up. So this elevation was 42.4. And again, that is the seasonal high water. And then we have this PB2, 42.9. Now this is a really, really good lesson and I'm glad that we found this. So if I know that this pond is going to discharge into this wetland, I do not think I would want to set my seasonal high water lower than the seasonal high water of this wetland. Why? Because then you get backflow. What you need in your pond system and any of your drainage systems is positive outflow. That's one of the most important things you need to know. Consider this my boundary condition. I'm plugging my system in to the downstream of the system. And this downstream of the system is a seasonal high water of 43. And during some sort of storm event, it has a hydrograph and it will go up so many feet. Uh, and we, you know, we can get to a different video later about how we can set our tailwater conditions, but this is what we're dealing with right now. If I set a seasonal high water lower than that, I have backflow and that's not good. Now there's a few other things that I wanna look at because even though we've received a survey and the surveyor and the environmental scientist said that the seasonal high water is 43, I still wanna look at the survey and I wanna understand where my outfall is going to be along our pond. So let's go to this survey here. I'm gonna be looking at the northeast corner up here. So let's go to the northeast corner. And we have this wetland line that was staked. Let me put a little line around it. So here's our wetland line, does something like this. And those wetland lines are established by the environmental scientist and surveyor. They're going out there and establishing that line. That is where they think the wetland line is. And it's all based on biological indicators, wet spots, 
where water might be. There might be a forest, there might be shrubbery. You know, I'm not an environmental scientist, but they established this line. Now, one thing I want to notice is just to make sure that, you know, we're going to have positive outflow. If I set my pond's control water level to 43, let me draw a little diagram right here. Here's a little cross section of a pond. You know, it's going to look something like this. Here's my little water line. I'll make that blue just so you know. So there's my little water level line. And then let's say my wetland is like over here, right? And I'm gonna match existing grade somewhere at that wetland line or wetland buffer. And typically what you have is some sort of control box. I need to change this default. I'm gonna set that as a default. Normally you have some sort of control box and we can get to these in later videos, but you have some sort of control box that's outfalling, you know, either via a pipe and then a sump area over here, or sometimes you can even put this control box over here. I've seen it time and time again. You have a pipe, and then the control box is controlling the rate of that pond into the wetland. Uh, and yes, we can do that. It is all hydraulically connected. But since we're doing this, do you guys understand what we're trying to achieve here? We're trying to have positive outfall from this pond into this wetland. So let's say if that wetland's water level, the seasonal high water level was up here, and if we set our design water level right there, well, what's gonna happen when we run our models and in real life? Well, if we were to put a little cut opening weir right there in our box, we're gonna have a whole bunch of back discharge into our pond. That's not what we want. So that's why we would go and set this pond either at or a little bit above whatever the seasonal high is or control elevation of this wetland. So in this case, I'm seeing a lot of grades around 42.9, 42.4, it's relatively close to that 43 elevation, which lets me know that we are going to get some positive outflow here. And you know, the last thing that we would wanna see around this wetland line is anything higher than 43. You know, if I were to see a whole bunch of, let's just say, you know, as an example, let's say we came over here and it was like elevation 46 all throughout uh, this wetland line. And if I were to set my pond, normal water, control water, at 43, this is what that looks like. So if this water level was 43, but my existing grade is all the way up here at 46, Y'all tell me if that has positive outfall. I'm going to have to dig the earth, dig the earth right there down to my box opening so I can release the water out into the open environment. And if y'all are having trouble understanding this, uh, I can make more videos about outfalls. I don't want to dive too deep. You know, this is a common mistake that I see some really younger engineers make is not understanding these outfall connections. You have to have positive outfall. So since we confirmed that the wetland seasonal high is 43, which is technically higher than the seasonal high water gathered from the geotech bores, and since we know that we'll make positive outflow based on the survey, I feel pretty comfortable setting that control water level at elevation 43. I do wanna dive into the high level of how we're thinking about stormwater management. So in this case with this pond, like I said earlier, we have to be able to treat and attenuate stormwater into this pond. Now, what do I even mean by that? Well, this pond right here has a basin. And let's say that this basin wraps all the way around and we have to treat and attenuate all of this water that we're going to collect. So any water droplet that falls within this yellow area, I have to be able to treat it. Well, what does treatment even mean? Treatment is letting biology in the pond do its thing. So when all of these greases and oils from your cars hit the pavement, it wants to rush into the pond and your pond has a permanent pool of water that lets biology do its thing. It lets all the greases settle, all the sediment settle and treats it before it actually discharges back into the environment. And sometimes what you can do is set up little pre-treatment swales or little dry retention areas to pre-treat the water before it goes into your wet pond system. How I like to think about this is the way someone explained it to me a long time ago, it's like you have a dirty plate of spaghetti and that immediate turn on of the faucet on that plate is pretty much like treatment. Think of all those little greases 
on the road, on the lots, the fertilizers, you're treating that first little one inch of runoff of that basin area. So when you're treating all of these pollutants into the pond, what you're designing for is a volume within the pond. And a lot of times it's anywhere between half an inch to one inch, but it always varies on your municipality. So for instance, if this was, let's say one acre, let's just for ease, if this was one acre, I would have to treat one inch over that acre. Now, if you multiply the one inch by an acre, that gives you a volume because now you have a cube. So if I were to convert that to like an acre feet, it would be the one acre multiplied by the one inch divided by 12, which is roughly 0 0.08 acre feet. So I would have to hold that much volume of water within this pond. Now again, I'm keeping this all high level, so I'll make more videos about treatment, but we're not even done yet. So that's the first step. You always have to verify your treatment requirements. Every municipality is different. The second thing you need to do is verify your attenuation. So attenuation means I need to store a certain amount of water in this pond and release it. We attenuate water because again, we do not want to cause any rise of stage downstream. Now this usually involves modeling in programs like ICPR, now known as Stormwise, HECRAS, SWIM, but you can also do some calculations on your own using spreadsheets and hydrographs. There are fancy ways to do that there. Now this one acre basin is going to generate an amount of runoff. It's going to generate a CFS or a flow, and it's all going to go to this pond, and that pond is going to rise to an elevation. And this pond right here has a control structure right there that has different weirs. And if I were to draw a little cross section of what this might look like, it'll look something like this. It'll have little weir cuts in the box. And when this water level, assume that this is the water level, this little blue line, when this water level rises, it's going out of the box and into the wetland. So our job as a civil engineer is to design these widths of weir cuts to make sure that we're not flooding downstream properties. And that's, that's, really, that's really what we're trying to do in our drainage design. That's honestly all I have for today, guys. I hope that this was helpful. I tried to make it short and sweet for everyone. I know a lot of people have been wanting some intro to drainage design, and this was as high level as I could make it. I feel like we went over some pretty good details. I'll definitely make some more videos related to the nitty gritty details of treatment calculations and hydraulic modeling, but I feel like it's really important to just understand the high level basics before diving into the details. Appreciate everyone's time. If you learned something new, drop a comment below. Tell me if you're a civil engineer or new in the industry. I'm always excited to grow this community and I hope you guys have a great day. I will see you in the next video. Peace out.